Hey folks, in this video, we're gonna be looking at another instructive game uh, submitted to us via our Patreon page. And yeah, today we have a very interesting game submitted by Stefano uh, playing black here against a uh, lower rated player. And what we'll see in this game is black actually making a number of what I would call maybe practical uh, mistakes in the game that we can definitely uh, discuss. So this was a classical game. I believe both players had around 45 uh, minutes or so. And we get e4, c6, the caro con, d4, d5. And here white plays the advanced variation with e5. So one of many good moves that white has uh, in this position and one of many good lines white can play against the caro con. Uh, so here black plays the main move, bishop f5, developing the bishop before uh, blocking it off with the move e6. And now white throws out this move g4. Um, and now this is a move that has been played in this position many, many times and by some really, really strong grandmasters. Uh, though I personally don't love this move um, from White's point of view. I think it's very committal. You're taking a lot of space, but you're also creating a lot of weaknesses in the position. And Black kind of takes advantage of this with the move uh, Bishop to E4, which I think is a very clever move. The point is to kind of provoke White into playing F3, which weakens the position for White even further, and then returning with the Bishop back uh, to G6. And if white tries to ever trap this bishop with a move like h4, black is always going to be in time here to play h5 or h6 and give the bishop uh, a retreat. Um, and while this position, I think, is certainly playable for white, it's very, very difficult to handle because white has just been pushing pawns, has very little development, has a lot of weaknesses to account for, and yet yeah, not the easiest position uh, to handle. Uh, instead, a lot of people do like this move h4 in this position, which is not as weakening as g4, but does come with a pretty devious trap. And this is a very uh, popular trap, so I just quickly want to show here. If you play e6 as black, well, now white is trapping the bishop with g4 because they've played this h4 move in advance. And if we play bishop g6, they get h5. We play bishop e4, white gets f3, and the bishop is caught. And it works in the other move order as well. If black starts with bishop e4, white plays f3, and the bishop has no way to get out uh, of being lost here. So this h4 move that comes with this trick, uh, there's actually a lot more to it. It's not just based on this one trap. Normally black plays h6 here or h5, and the game continues quite sharply. Um, but white's idea is that now we've kind of created a g5 square for ourselves, or if black plays h6, which is another very sensible move, then here white has already started to take space on uh, the king side and can follow up with moves like bishop d3 or maybe even g4 at some point and just keep uh, advancing forward. Um, very, very sharp positions. And I'm not sure I would recommend h4 uh, as well. I think it's a really, really sharp line, one of the best ways to play. I think if I was white in this position, I would opt for just like a simple knight f3 followed by bishop to e2 setup. This is known as the short system uh, named after Grandmaster Nigel Short. And just castling king side and then eventually maybe looking to either play on the queen side and taking space there or playing on uh, the king side. And the positions are very, very interesting. Uh, I don't think white should trade off the light squared bishops until maybe later on. I think the bishop should go to e2. And yeah, white can try to use their space advantage moving forward with all of the pieces still on the board. So in the game, we get g4. Now black plays bishop e4, and I think f3 is probably what white should do at this point, but instead white goes knight f3. And yeah, I'm not a fan of this move because white is kind of self-pinning. Now the rook on h1 is a big target, and black's bishop on e4 is very strong. Um, so Stefano continues e6, knight c3 going after the bishop, and bishop b4. Very, very reasonable move, stopping white from taking with knight takes e4, pinning the knight, and after white plays a3, Black follows up consistently and takes on c3. And we end up getting this kind of position. And so this one very much reminds me of uh, the French winnower. And this is one of the things about the Caro Khan. A lot of times it turns into just a very good French defense. If we just quickly compare the positions, we're comparing this one with what we would might get out of the opening if Black were to start with the French and white goes d4, d5, knight c3, bishop to b4. This is known as the winnower variation. And here what often happens is white will advance with e5 to take space, black will play c5 to fight for the center, white goes a3, 
and black will go ahead and trade on c3 and give up the bishop pair in order to weaken white structure on the queen side. And we get a structure like this that is very, very fighting and very dynamic. White has the two bishops, including the very strong dark squared bishop, because it's unopposed. Black has no dark squared bishop to fight against it. But in return, black has this long-term counterplay on the c-file against white's weaknesses. Now, comparing this position to the one we get in the game, we see some differences. Black hasn't played c5 yet, but the biggest difference, as you probably noticed, is that the bishop on e4 is much, much stronger than if it were on c8. And that's why the caro is often considered like an improved French, because sometimes you get these positions. It's basically a French defense, except Black's bishop is now outside the pawn chain. Black has solved the one problem Black has in the French, which is, uh, the, or let's say the main problem, not the only problem, but the main problem, which is uh, this bad light square bishop. But here the light square bishop is just an absolute monster. And best White can hope for is to one day exchange it off. Uh, so already Black has a very nice position here. And uh, we continue with knight e7, which I think makes sense. Bishop g2. And now h6, uh, which Stefano writes is to control the g5 square and give the bishop a possible retreat square on h7. I think h6 is a fine move. I would have also considered the move h5, which is a very thematic idea in the Karo Khan and the French and in uh, similar types of positions. And the point of this one is to fight for the f5 square because black is attacking the g4 pawn. If white takes on h5 or pushes g5, Black gets a fantastic score on f5 for the knight, and structurally, black is doing wonderful. Now, long term, what black, I think, should be playing for in this position uh, is actually playing on the queen side. So I think black should be going for c5, maybe bringing the knight to c6, and then bringing the rook to c8, maybe queen a5, and just putting all of the pressure on white's queen side here. And with the king side totally blocked, this knight on f5, an absolute rock, I think white's position is just very, very difficult here. Instead, maybe white should just try to keep the pawn on g4 with something like h3 and uh, keep this f5 square under control. But then I think black is still doing really well. At any point, we can take on g4 and take on h1. We can also leave the tension and make it awkward for white to castle king side. As soon as white castles, then we take on g4, open the h file, and our rook is going to be uh, super active here. So I very much like this for black as well, but okay, we get h6, white castles. Uh, now black goes knight to d7. And once again here, I would have strongly considered a move like c5. And the point would be to bring this knight out to c6, where it might be a little bit more active, uh, followed by bringing the rook to c8, and again, putting pressure on the queen side. Uh, but knight d7 is fine. White plays bishop f4. Uh, and now Stefano plays g5, which I think is kind of an instructive, I wouldn't call it a mistake, but I would say that this move is certainly not best. And it looks very tempting because we're hitting the bishop and Stefano writes that just trying to grab some space while attacking the bishop. But we have to be very clear about what we're doing here as black. And I get the feeling that black wasn't quite sure how they're going to be completing their development in this uh, position in terms of what they're looking for. And it's very important before we play a committal move like g5 that we do figure out what we want to do in this position. So why is g5 committal? Because once we play g5, it becomes very awkward for black to ever castle king side because now we've weakened ourselves on the king side. This g5 pawn will always be a target and why we'll have potential chances. So once we play g5, we have to recognize that now we're actually committing to either playing with our king in the center, which long term isn't so great. We want our rooks to be connected um, or castling queenside, which is fine. But then we have to be very clear that that's what we're playing for. We want to put the king on c8, which is not that bad, because even though white has the open b file, white has very few pieces on the queen side. So there's very little actually that white can do to us if the king is on c8. And in the meantime, black can bring the other rook to g8 and maybe play h5 one day and look to get counterplay on the king side. So that certainly makes sense as an overall plan, but then we have to uh, execute it properly. To me, I'm not sure if this is right. Again, I would think something like c5 makes sense or even just castling followed by c5. And again, the point here that I'm trying to stress is that uh, black's play is probably going to be more successful on the queen side here. White has no pieces on the queen side. 
Bishop on g2 doesn't attack uh, the queen side at all. Bishop on f4 is also misplaced. Knight on f3 is supporting the center, but not doing much else. Yeah, all of white's minor pieces here are quite bad here. And this is what I think uh, gives black the right to kind of just play rook c8, c5, put pressure on the c file, queen a5. And I think white would have a very hard time uh, defending all of these weaknesses. And if something like queen d2, for example, looking to ex uh, trade on h6, or let's say sack on h6 and go for the attack, I don't think white is really going to have enough here. The bishop on e4 defends a lot of squares. The knight on uh, e7 is also quite strong here and can uh, support as well. So I think black can go ahead and play c5 and not worry about the attack uh, whatsoever. If white does take on h6, then okay, we can trade off on f3, not to allow black uh, white's knight to come to g5, take, take, knight g6, and white is not going to be giving checkmate here. The queen can come in and defend, and uh, black is going to be just up a piece. So that would be my approach in this position. We have a really nice French. Just put the king uh, on g8, put a rook on c8, c5, simple chess, put pressure on the c file, and I think black is doing great. Instead, we get g5. White plays bishop e3, and now it's still not too late to revert to this queenside plan. So something like queen a5 would make sense, followed by castling queenside, bringing a rook to g8, and eventually maybe breaking with h5 and looking to open lines on the king side. Even if black has to sacrifice a pawn, opening lines on the king side with white's king on g1, at this point, makes a lot of sense if our king is tucked away on the opposite side of the board. So at this point, I think black should now go for opposite sides castling and play for the attack. Instead, we get f6. And this is a very thematic move, but I would say a big, big mistake in this position. Number one, we're opening the center while our king is still on e8. And as we'll see, black ends up uh, suffering for this because the king gets stuck and under heavy fire. Um, secondly, after white takes on f6 and we go knight takes f6, we have all of a sudden created a wonderful outpost for white's knight on e5, which white immediately takes advantage of and just plants that knight in there. And if we just go back two moves, this knight on f3 was suffering with zero prospects other than one day hoping to trade off for one of black's pieces. But as soon as we play f6, we've all of a sudden given a fresh life to this knight. And now the knight on e5 is just a monster piece. Very, very strong on a total outpost. No pawns can attack this knight. Now black can only hope to trade off this knight one day. So even though f6 is kind of a thematic move in the French and Caro, it comes up a lot. It doesn't mean that it's uh, always the right move to play in, in the position. Here, black really needed to be castled and the king needed to be on the queen side far away from all the action before opening up uh, the center. So now after takes takes, uh, Stefano writes, uh, since my king side pawn structure wasn't fit for castling anymore, the point of these two moves, g5 and f6, was to open up a file before moving my king out of the way and attacking on that side. Uh, the problem was that I wasn't fast enough in executing this plan. Yeah, exactly right. Here, black does things in the wrong order. I would say you need to first get your king safe and castled, and then you can think about opening lines in the center or on the king side, not while our king is still on e8, because it's not like we're one move from castling. It's not like we just castle next move and that's it. We still need to move our queen out of the way. We owe white this tempo, and only then we can castle. So definitely, we did this in kind of the wrong move order here as now white can actually set up some initiative. So knight e5, uh, black trades on g2, king takes g2, and rook g8. So Stefano here writes, needlessly cautious. My idea here was to prevent the possibility of the opponent's knight uh, jumping to f7 uh, in case uh, of queenside castling. And so he uh, avoids this idea with rook to g8. So yeah, a little bit slow here, but the point is that he now recognizes that if he goes queen c7 and queenside castling, white is gonna have knight f7 winning the exchange, which is a concern. We don't wanna just lose the exchange uh, for no reason, but this is something that we should have anticipated before we played f6 and allowed white's knight uh, onto e5, because now black is experiencing very, very serious issues here. Not to mention this e6 pawn is certainly a long-term weakness uh, that white can put pressure on in the future on the e-file. So rook g8, and now white plays f4, which is a very double-edged move, but makes a lot of sense for white to open up the f-file and start attacking uh, black's king. 
Now at this point, black plays knight e4. I think um, probably the best thing at this point would have been just to go gf4, just to at least open up the g file. Because one way or another, the f file is gonna be open and black is going to be in trouble. At least by opening the g file, Black can hope for some counter chances against White's king. I think this would have been the natural move to do, uh, even though White can play rook takes f4, and I think White is still doing very well here. Um, g4 was the move here, because we got to open up the, the g file for our own rook, and then, okay, we hope to castle queenside, um, but it's going to be tough, but that's uh, <laughs> that's the position where we're now in. But at least the rook would be active on the g file and giving Black some tactical chances. Uh, instead, we see knight e4. White takes on g5, hg, queen f3. And yeah, all of a sudden, black is just in, in huge, huge danger here. White is threatening maiden one. And yeah, the king just never gets out of the center. And so uh, big, big problems for black. Queen d6 is played. And now white goes rook to b1. I think this is a reasonable move. I think already uh, white could have won the game with the move queen f7 check. Uh, followed by queen takes g8, a nice little sacrifice, but the point is that white is getting knight f7 next move, and so white gives the queen for a rook, black is forced to take back, then white plays knight f7, and is going to be winning back the queen for just the knight, and ending up with an extra exchange in the end game uh, with a completely winning position. Instead, uh, white starts with rook ab1, which I guess kind of makes sense. I think he's provoking black into uh, castling here so that he can play knight to f7 and win the exchange this way, uh, which is certainly reasonable. And Stefano actually doesn't uh, castle. He ends up playing rook to b8. And I think this might be maybe one of the most instructive mistakes uh, of the game. Uh, so Stefano writes, the queenside castling was the first move I evaluated, but gave it up as soon as I saw uh, the knight forking the queen and rook. So basically he rejects castling because of knight f7. I'm losing the exchange, I need to avoid this, right? And and starts looking for a different move. Uh, but the point, as Stefano realizes uh, and, and writes in his notes, is that actually black's position is so bad that losing the exchange might not be the worst fate in the world here. The real problem for black is the king on e8. Uh, so this move rook to b8 defends the b-pawn and solves this issue, but this is kind of the least of black's concerns in this position. The king being on e8 is a much, much bigger concern, and uh, I actually made a video about this kind of thing on our channel earlier, uh, this video called uh, Instructive Mistakes, Sensing the Danger. Uh, it's also in, in this series and, and should be in, in this playlist. And in that video, I kind of talk about how players tend to do this. They notice one possible threat from the opponent, they assume that's kind of the end of the world, and in order to avoid this threat, in order to avoid losing the exchange or losing the b-pawn, uh, they end up making their position a lot worse and not sensing the danger, the fact that their position is actually critical. Because now after rook to b8, black has given up the right to castle queenside. So now the king is just stuck on e8, white still has a bunch of pieces to attack, open f-file, super active queen, super active knight on e5, and yeah, now things are even, even worse for, for Black. So what should Black have done? Well, Black should have just gone ahead and castled and realized that the price of an exchange uh, is nothing compared to getting mated, <laughs> right? So if Black does something like this, queen c7, knight takes d8, uh, and as Stefano writes uh, in his notes, the point now is that the king is so much safer that at least here, black has some chances of surviving. It's not as easy for white to attack. White still has a very good position and good winning chances, but it's not nearly the same as it, it turns out in, in the game. Here, um, white's chances are a lot harder. Stefano includes a nice resource here with the rook to h8. Black can throw this one in to hit the h2 pawn, force white to defend, and then recapture on d8, maybe a little bit more accurate. Um, but regardless of all these lines, the main point here is that uh, very, very critical to look at everything that's going on in the position. And sometimes a pawn might be hanging or you might be losing an exchange. But again, that's way better than getting yourself mated. So you got to be very, very careful about being too materialistic and being a little bit too superficial with the threats. So rook b8 is played. Uh, and now white goes queen f7 check, uh, king to d8. 
And once again, white has this nice tactic, queen takes g8, uh, followed by knight to f7, winning uh, the exchange, but I would say on much better circumstances compared to when black has castled, because here, um, well, white gets into the endgame. Let's say something like this, king takes, can follow up with a move like h4 here. White is going to get a super strong passed pawn. Uh, in fact, black can't even take here because of bishop f4 check and the rook on b8 ends up hanging. White's rook is coming down to f7. Uh, this is not the same exchange down position as when black castled queenside. Here black has very little counterplay and white's pieces are just super, super active. Black can take on c3 at some point, but this pawn uh, is not very consequential for uh, the position. Um, white's activity here is much more important and white is just completely winning. So white misses this trick and this is a nice we can call it clearance tactic, where white would like to clear the f7 square for the knight, and so does so with tempo. So that's a very nice kind of puzzle rush style tactic, good to watch out for. Uh, instead, white plays for h4 and starts to go for uh, pushing the h-pawn, also I think wanting to get the bishop to f4 in case black takes. Uh, black goes king c7, just trying to connect the rooks, h5. In rook bf8. And at this point, it's hard to suggest anything for black because the position is really, really difficult. White is super active, has this pin on the seventh rank. Rook f8, I think, is a, a reasonable try. And white avoids taking, goes queen h7. I think another instructive moment here. White definitely could have taken on f8 and, and won the two rooks for the queen. And I think this is the kind of exchange that a lot of players, uh, they don't like to make because... Uh, they like the queen, they don't They don't feel as comfortable handling the two rooks. But I think that's a nice example of where the two rooks should absolutely be uh, dominating black's queen. As white's rooks are very active, the knight on e5 is still a monster, and this h-pawn can uh, quickly run and just promote. And so it's very, very difficult for black's queen to do anything. The queen is just totally dominated. Um, nice instructive line I thought here was, let's say black plays queen takes a3, trying to grab some pawns. White can go rook f7, pinning this knight. And then let's say something like queen takes e3 again, just hoping for counterplay. We have rook takes e7 with check. King goes back, rook d7 check, king c8. And then white can take on b7 with the other rook. And now we get two rooks on the seventh. I actually just did a video uh, talking about the, the power of these two rooks on the seventh rank. And yeah, this is just devastating for black. Black can take the bishop on e3, but then just gets mated by force with rook c7, knight c6, and then multiple mates here, but rook takes a7 is the simplest. Um, so this is just a kind of a sample line to show the power of the two rooks. But basically black would have to stay super passive here, and then the h-pawn can just promote, and so it'd be a pretty convincing win for white. Um, instead, white starts to drift a little bit and is unable to find the, the knockout blow. Goes queen h7, uh, black chases, rick to g8, queen f7. Uh, at this point, I think black should just be trying to repeat moves, <laughs> but Stefano, playing lower rated player, uh, plays for the win. And now white starts uh, messing up rick f6, trying to win the e6 pawn, but hanging the rook. And the funny thing is that after black wins the exchange here, Black is actually still worse in this position. The pieces are still dominated, but okay, now, once you lose the exchange, psychologically uh, becomes a difficult situation for white, especially if that's not what they were intending. And uh, yeah, white ends up blowing the game in a couple of moves. Uh, rook h7, knight f7 is played, queen d7, knight takes g5. Uh, now black throws an e5. Really, really excellent move. Maybe uh, one of black's best moves in the game opening up the queen on to the g4 pawn and uh, creating some counterplay, some real, real counterplay in the position. And all of a sudden, things are opening up. Black's rooks are now active. G4 pawn is hanging. And yeah, white is in uh, big, big danger. I think white ends up immediately going wrong here. Um, actually, I like king g3 very, very much, uh, just defending the pawn. Knight takes h7 would be a blunder if you have queen takes g4. And then black gets a ton of counterplay uh, against white's king. Very, very serious attack here. Uh, instead, white goes king g3. Uh, black drops back. Uh, and here, unfortunately, white blunders with knight to f7. And simply hangs the g4 pawn, uh, giving away the game. So quite an unfortunate uh, mistake from white. I think white is still doing really well if they take on e5, for example. They have a lot of pawns for the exchange. Black doesn't really have any huge threats. White can play queen e6 or queen d6 at some point if they need uh, to trade off the queen. And uh, yeah, white is doing really, really well here. But 
unfortunately, after knight f7, queen takes g4, it's uh, it's all over. And yeah, black actually finds kind of a nice way to simplify here. Queen h1 check, queen f1, takes, takes, rook f8. The knight is lost. White was already down in exchange. Now white is going to be down a full rook. And yeah, the game is uh, simply over from here. And, and black doesn't have any, any issues whatsoever uh, converting from this point. So yeah, really sharp game. I thought a lot of instructive moments here in that middle game, uh, especially when it comes to finding a plan and figuring out how exactly to play the position. Um, hopefully this was useful to all you Caro Khan and perhaps French players out there uh, as well. I think these positions are not easy to handle, um, but yeah, there is hopefully some strategic insight uh, to be gained. Uh, all right, guys, that's gonna wrap it up for this video. If you enjoyed it, please uh, let me know in the comment section below and uh, do subscribe to the channel if you haven't already. And hopefully I will see you in the next video. Take care.